What's up, gangsters? How about episode two of the Bruff Superior Adventure? Uh, in the first episode, if you watched that, I, that was really just kind of cracking into it, taking a look at all the parts. This episode really gets into working on the, um, uh, the parts of the wheels, the rims and the hubs, and they, uh, they were a lot of work. Uh, but this gets all the way through to the point where they are ready to start priming. So, here we go. Okay, so it's a couple of days later, and I am still grinding away. And I promise that this entire series is not going to be just a bunch of uh, episodes and commentary about grinding, even though that's kind of how it seems like this project is going to go. But that's just part of the learning curve at the beginning to figure out how to handle this white metal. And as you can see... I have a, hopefully it'll show up on camera, I have a very lovely and uniform brushed metal finish on this rim now. And this is because of the, uh, uh, one of the tools that I was waiting for to come in uh, at the end of the last segment are these little abrasive wheels. Uh, I got a whole bag of these things, uh, 40 of them, on Amazon for about 10 bucks, and they are fantastic. Um, it's uh, this, I've got it pulled up right here on my Amazon app, um, and they are, okay, I thought I did, alright, yeah, so they are these little things. Uh, 40 pieces of abrasive buffing wheels, fine, medium, coarse satin. And this is kind of funny, uh, 120 girt. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you can see that the yellow one is the coarsest, um, the red one is the finest, and then you've got uh, the other two in between. Now I've only tinkered a little bit with each one of them, um, I ended up taking the 240 girt red one and uh, trimming some material off the edges of it so it would be narrower and that worked really good for getting in between the uh, nipple bulges. <laughs> I get to say nipple bulges again. Um, it's going to be a drinking game. Every time I say nipple bulges you have to knock back a, a shot of tequila. Uh, anyhow, so it's good because I can get it in between there and not worry too much about uh, taking material off of them because it definitely will, even with this one being the uh, uh, one of the finer girts. Um, at, at any rate, it's good because once I got uh, to where I was satisfied with all of uh, you know this stuff being removed, then I just basically went around and around until I had a nice uniform finish. Um, and, and, I, and I may even use this to try and make all of the nipple bulges uh, the same because you can see that they are not. Uh, they weren't cast equally to begin with and all of my work has made some of them a little smaller so I may just uh, go through and make all of them uniform. Anyway, this, these, these little wheels are pretty good. Um, I took the, uh, the very roughest girt the 80 girt, and I was able to actually, if you take a look at this fixture piece, you can see that it's got 3D printing layer lines on it right there, and I used that tan wheel just as an experiment, and I was able to just grind those right off within a few minutes. So they're handy. I think they're gonna they're gonna be very useful for this project, but. I still have the issue. I, I, I worked on this piece a little bit and you can see I still have the issue of there being some pits in that surface. And so what I'm moving towards is just going ahead and shooting primer on, on these parts uh, and uh, see how that goes and see how they look after they have primer. I really don't want to do the whole prime and sand thing on all these little metal parts just to clean up the pits. But I'm going to have to see how much they show and how much it bothers me. Now, one thing that may help, and this is the other tool that I was waiting on, is this gizmo right here. 
this Master Air Eraser. I've been checking this out online and watching some YouTube videos about it, and I decided to give it a try. This seemed, honestly, like a way better investment than a $150 uh, magnetic jewelry tumbler because uh, not only will this remove any oxides or grunge or mold release or whatever that we think is the reason that we need to tumble this stuff but it's going to leave as uh, far as I can tell from watching the YouTube videos um, a nice uniform dull uh, kind of, uh, of, a, of a finish uh, that'll have a little bit of a micro texture to it. Um, that's what bead blasting does, and I've done lots of bead blasting uh, back in the day, uh, but it remains to be seen if this little thing running off of my hobby compressor will actually do the same thing. According to the videos and the reviews I've watched, it will, but um, there was also one guy who didn't think it worked all that great and he ended up basically just making a bunch of modifications and he was he turned his own brass nozzles on his lathe and made a bigger nozzle and did all kinds of crazy things that I'm not gonna do um, I'm just gonna see if it works like it is um, and and it, if, it, if it does work then not only may it, may it be a good way to get a nice, clean, uniform, and very grippy for primer finish on, on uh, some of these parts. But it's also going to be a good way to produce a nice uh, cast look on, on some of them where that might be appropriate. So anyway, uh, this is kind of cool. It cost me about 60 bucks. Uh, it comes with more stuff than I need. It's got this hose with an included, uh, looks like an included water trap. It's kind of cool to save that hose. That might be something good to have for other airbrushes. Came with this uh, container of uh, aluminum oxide abrasive grit, uh, which is going to make a mess. I'm going to have to try and figure out how to minimize that. Uh, it's got a little hanger hook if I want to use that. And it even has <laughs> a very wrinkled up mask. So. Anyway, uh, and there are other brands of these. This seems to just basically be made by one Chinese manufacturer and labeled by a bunch of different companies like TCP, uh, Harbor Freight, whatever. So we'll see how it works. Uh, Pash, Pache also, or Posh, or I can't even remember how to pronounce it. They also make one of their own. Badger has one. I, I chose this one because it was... Uh, not only uh, the, the least expensive, but it's the one that's in all the reviews that I watched on YouTube A. So, anyhow, we'll see how that goes, and I will report back soon. Okay, so I have gotten pretty tired of drilling, or of uh, grinding and polishing, so I've decided to do some drilling, because... There's uh, lots of drilling and tapping that has to take place on these parts of the hub. So, you can see right here um, that they call for a 1.4 millimeter by 3 millimeter screw, which they've given you all those. But what they don't tell you is um, what the tap drill size is. So that's a fairly easy thing to look up, but you know, for 500 bucks, that should be in the instructions. And it is, in fact, a 1.1 millimeter uh, hole. So I'm pilot drilling with a one millimeter bit, and I will clean drill it, or chase it, as they call it, with the 1.1. The other thing is that some of these screws, uh, or some of these holes, are uh, just pass-through, or clearance holes. And some of them are drilled and tapped, and they don't tell you. You have to figure that out for yourself. And again, it's relatively obvious, but that's the kind of thing that should be explicitly called out. You can see that on these outside parts right here, this one and this one, those are going to need to be pass-throughs. 
And so I'll make them, uh, I'll probably just drill them with a 1.5 millimeter or a slightly larger uh, one, like I have a 1.47, I think. So I'll drill those clean through and uh, then I'll tap those. Now I've already drilled some of these and uh, this uh, white metal drills very nice and clean. What I'm using is, you can see, hopefully, I've got my Proxon EF50 micro moat mounted onto its little drill press stand, which is a very handy bit of kit. And, um, you know, this thing, it's nice because I've got my foot feet hooked up to it, so I can just kick it on and start the, you know, so I can position the bit uh, properly. And one nice thing that they did do for you on all these pieces, uh, you can see, is that they gave you a tiny little divot. If the camera will focus in on it, see there, those two divots are molded in there. So you don't have to center punch anything or, or locate the holes. So that's nice at least. All you have to do really is position the thing. And I've got these uh, mounted on this double sticky tape because uh, there's nothing else to grip them on. And um, hopefully that'll work as a, a fixturing setup. We're about to find out here live on camera. Not really the kind of thing I should be doing live on camera because that invites Murphy to come and fuck things up, but we'll see what happens. Um, at any rate, here we go. So just position the drill. Pop it right through, just like that. This uh, white metal drills real nice. Super clean, super clean little holes. And so, because it is so soft, and I have a brand spanking new sharp bit, which is always important, uh, the fact that I'm spinning it at 5,000 RPM or whatever the minimum speed of this Proxon thing is, I'm popping these holes with no problem. I'll come back when it's time to tap them all. Okay, so it is next day and it has been a, just a riot of <laughs> drilling and tapping. I knew when I bought this little tap and die set that it was gonna come in handy. Uh, this is uh, something I found on eBay, or not eBay, but Amazon rather, uh, when I looked, just looking for miniature metric tap, uh, and tap and die set. Um, you know, it's, I don't think it's super heavy duty. It's kind of janky. It's got this cast tapping handle. Uh, but for our purposes, um, it, it's great. I specifically bought it to use on uh, Tamiya motorcycle kits because they use those silly screws for so much of the uh, major assembly parts and it's just much much easier to actually tap the holes because the uh, metric screws that you get are not self tappers. So anyhow I'm just really glad I have it. Um, and uh, you can see that I have assembled uh, a, a few of these things. This is the front hub. And uh, it was, uh, th this is the hardest one because you've got these two screws on this side and then you've got four on this side. And these four were tough because if you look at the length of the screws versus the depth of the part, well, they're about the same. And so that means that, uh, that, that uh, drilling it deep enough that, you've get, that you can thread it completely enough for that length of screw without popping out the back side here 
is a little bit of a challenge. And part of that is simply not having the exact right tool. And let me explain what I mean by that. These taps are what's called through taps, which means that they are designed to tap holes that are drilled all the way through something. And you can tell that because they have a tapered and pointed tip on them. What you really need for something like I had to do on this little gizmo here is what's called a bottoming tap or a blind tap. And they're different because the end is basically squared off and not nearly as tapered. And that lets you run the threads further down into the hole. So, but I can, you know, I've each, this little tap set's nice because it comes with two of these and I could have, I could have ground the end of that off and basically turned it into a bottoming tap, but I wasn't quite that desperate. I was able to get it done, although after uh, screwing uh, several of these in, I discovered that two of the screws were, of course, like two threads too long still. Or the, actually the holes were threaded two threads too short, <laughs> whatever. Anyway, the screws were sticking out too damn far, and I ended up just clipping them off, and it worked fine. So that's all gone together. I'm um, thinking about running a bead of super glue or something around that joint there to kind of make it look more like one piece because as far as I know on the real hub it was all one piece that was cast and then machined so probably gonna do that but anyway all the screw heads get hidden further downstream in the assembly so you don't have to worry about that and <clears throat> having done just this tiny bit of assembly so far um, I, I'm pleased with the way that the parts fit together. Um, they, 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 do, they do fit together nicely, and that's a relief because having to fettle things just so that they will go together is bad enough with plastic parts. And definitely don't want to get into that with metal parts. Anyway, you can see that the way I'm tapping these is I've got this, uh, I've got this tap uh, inserted into this pin vise that's got a keyless chuck on it and if you're if you've never done this kind of thing before it can be kind of intimidating I have done plenty of it so it's not too big of a deal for me um, you just have to be methodical uh, you know a little bit of pressure on the on the end of the thing um, and this is really soft metal and these threads are really fine so the tap cuts very easily you don't need any oil or anything and once it gets in there a little bit it pretty much guides itself um, and if it's a little bit crooked it's not going to be the end of the world because you have to remember these screws only have to go in there once and um, honestly if one hole fails you can drill it out and just glue the screw in there because the other screw or screws will be uh, plenty sufficient to hold the thing together. Anyway, once uh, it's it's in there far enough, you know, then just unscrew it. I this tapping handle is is really only for you know where you really need a little more leverage and it's not very stable and and it just it I don't like using it so this is a much better thing. Now. The ideal way to do this is really with a drill press because what you want obviously is for your tap to go straight down into that hole and the only way to guarantee that is to make sure that the tap is running on the same axis that the drill bit was. And so a drill press is the ideal thing. Unfortunately, this drill press is not really set up for it because it, even if I put the tap in the in the end of the of the prox on here it's just hard to turn you also have to use one hand to uh, lower it as you're turning it and it, it's just a fixturing thing so it's a little bit more of a hassle but if you have a regular drill press with a good vise on it that's fixtured up then that's a, a nice easy thing to use uh, but they also make these things called tapping frames which basically is just kind of a of a of a sort of C-shaped thing that has a uh, a floating arbor in it that 
has a chuck on the end of it and you uh, chuck up your tap and uh, lower it into position on the hole and basically the weight of the arbor provides the downward pressure and all you have to do is spin it. Some of them even have a little crank on top that uh, makes it easy to do that and, and so they're really nice to have um, and you can get small miniature ones for this type of work I just uh, have never felt the need to buy one so anyway that's it that's tapping 101 and uh, I've got one more to go and then um, I can move on here's another little Easter egg I thought was worth including um, you sometimes find yourself needing a screwdriver and I just wanted to recommend this one from iFixit. Um, if you're not familiar with iFixit, they are awesome. They uh, mostly uh, are for like fixing computer stuff, um, but if you go to iFixit.com you'll see if you need to put a new hard drive in your computer or whatever, they give you a complete step-by-step -step thing with all the instructions and at the end of it it's like click here to order all the right tools and parts. But they also sell individual tool sets on uh, Amazon and this screwdriver set is really uh, fantastic. You can see it comes with a whole selection of bits, uh, Torx, Allen head, Phillips head, and uh, regular. Uh, so super, super handy. Highly recommended. Okay, here we go. I have now just finished my first test with this little miniature sandblaster. And <laughs> yeah, it is exactly as advertised. It works exactly like it should. <laughs> Which means two things. One, that I have perfectly prepared parts prior to painting. <laughs> Say that five times fast. And it made a mess, as all such devices do. I had to vacuum myself off, and I'm going to have to go take a shower. You can see on top of the thing there all of the grit that's collected. I tried to catch it in a, in a thing inside my paint booth. That was basically a totes fail. But it's all good. You know, these are the things we have to do sometimes in, in pursuit of, uh, of a good finish. But I've got my little compressor, uh, which is just a normal Badger Hobby compressor, cranked up to 50 PSI, and this thing was great. Let me show you the results. Uh, this is the grit here. It's aluminum oxide uh, that comes with the kit. And they, they, you can buy a more aggressive one, but I don't think I, I'm going to need it. Uh, anyway, here you go. Uh, you can see, hopefully it'll focus up there, you can see the surface finish that is, that is left. That is exactly what I would expect and what I want. I mean, you can't find a better surface for painting a metal part than that. So uh, I, am, I am pretty fired up about that. And you can see that it even etched the, uh, the steel photo etch parts which I was a little surprised at because they are plenty hard. Um, I, I, I know that from filing the little uh, nubs off of where I clipped off the, uh, the attachment points from the fret. You can see, I mean, it took the finish, the black oxide finish, right off those little screws too. I mean, that's fantastic. And it will actually remove small scratches if you work at it. You can see uh, on that upper portion there, I've got some scratches from filing and sanding that, that I did not see. I had, I had some over here on the left side that I decided to just focus on with the blaster to see if I could reduce those. And it'll do it, but it takes a long time and it gets, you know, it's just messy, so... I think I'll probably just deal with those uh, after I see how it looks uh, post-primer. What I do feel good about, though, is I think it's going to really hide all of the little pits that, that were there. So, bead blaster, perfect. Uh, messy, absolutely. 
But as far as I'm concerned, this little $50 investment was way smarter than going and buying some $150 or $200 magnetic jewelry tumbler that really would not leave the correct finish for painting anyway. Okay, so I have just finished a marathon of drilling because uh, when you deal with a motorcycle rim, typically you're going to have uh, 36 spokes on each one. So by the time you drill each of those, uh, uh, drill a pilot hole, then chase it, you've got 144 drills for the entire set and add a couple for the valve stems and it's 148 holes. <laughs> Uh, but at least it was made easier by my wonderful little Proxon Miss One. This is a fantastic tool. I've got a review on it elsewhere on my channel, but I've got it uh, hooked up to my Proxon power supply, which is routed through my Proxon foot switch. So I just tap it with my toe to kick it, uh, and uh, it's it's great. The only thing I don't like about it is the where the trigger's located and the fact that it's not a positive on switch, which is why in true Rube Goldberg fashion, I have it permanently turned on with this piece of tape. <laughs> hey, it's not stupid if it works, right? Anyhow, um, I'm glad I went ahead and, and did all of that drilling before uh, I bead blast these because, as you can see, there is uh, uh, quite a bit of, uh, of material that's got to be uh, deburred off of, of those holes, which I'm going to just do with uh, my little uh, scotch bright wheel. I should clean those up lickety-split, then bead blast, and then I'll be ready uh, to shoot some primer on these, finally. Um, and you can see that some of these are not perfectly lined up. Like, here's one that's really bad. Holy shit, that's terrible. Uh, let's see, where is it now? Oh, there it is. And the fact that I can't find it is why I'm not too worried about it. You can see that one is way off center. Um of the of the little of the nipple bulge. I get to say that again and you guys have to drink. Um, and yeah, this is one of those deals where I, I just uh, I just just decided to accept some imperfection because the thing with with uh, drilling for spokes is that um, yeah, you could conceivably fixture uh, for this and do it with a drill press. And yes, that would obviously be my preference, but I'm not really equipped for it because what you actually need, is a thing called a dividing head, which is a machine shop tool that uh, allows you to evenly space a pattern of holes ar around the circumference of a circle. Um, you just crank at a certain number of resolu revolutions to rotate the part a certain number of degrees. Um, but the thing that complicates it with, a, with spoke nipple holes is that it's a, a compound angle because not only is it off of the a off angle with respect to the center because let's get a, a hub out here as you can see the spoke is not going to be going from the hole uh, in the rim to the center line of the hub it's going off to the side so you've got that angle to deal with, plus you have the dish angle, which gets you from its location on the, on the rim out however far it has to go to uh, meet the hub flange, which the dish angle on these is fairly shallow, but you can see that that's basically caused by the difference in width between the rim and the hub. Not a, not a lot on, in this case. But nonetheless, um, it, it's a compound angle. Then it's complicated by the fact that uh, because they don't pass through the center line of the hub, each spoke pair is basically, the holes are basically parallel to each other. Like if you look at this hole and this hole, those center lines should be pretty close to parallel. 
they run to either side of the center line of the of the hub. So anyway, all of that long-winded explanation to basically say that fixturing is uh, is is a nightmare to, to, to drill all those exactly. So basically, yeah, it's just I just eyeballed it uh, by trying to get my drill um, uh, perpendicular to the little uh, land that they give you here. Which is nice because not only do they give you a molded in uh, center for the drill, uh, but they do give you that land that lets you kind of eyeball um, how the hole is supposed to go. And I'd say I didn't do too bad. I mean, for doing it, uh, uh, you know, for, for drilling 72 pilot holes, I'd say, you know, most of them are, are not, not too bad. And it's one of those things where you just, you know, have to take comfort in the fact that nobody can look at all 36 of them at once. And so you just turn the rim to the best spot for photographing it. <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Okay, so yes, again, with these stupid rims, I am super over these things. I, uh, ran the bead blaster on them this morning and they looked pretty good. I had a few uh, holes that I needed to clean out and for that I used these things which are another fantastic tool. These came to me through recommendation of Peter Buckingham which uh, if you don't know who Peter is he's He's uh, a member of uh, Scale Modeler's Critique Group as well as a motorcycle group, and he is a true world-class model maker um, and, and, and a real gentleman and a, and a fellow tool whore and a fellow dirt bike racer, although uh, he came a couple of generations before me. He actually was a dirt bike racer back in the 60s. Uh, and uh, I give him no end of shit about riding old, fat, slow motorcycles. <laughs> but he is an amazing model maker. In fact, he uh, built a one-ninth Protar kit uh, just this year that he remanufactured just about every part of, and he won gold in uh, the motorcycle class at Telford with it this past weekend. So anyway, he uh, anytime he recommends a tool, I listen, and, and these are one of his favorites. These little reamers... Uh, they're actually called jeweler's brooches. I got these from Rio Grande uh, if you're in the United States, but you can get them from other places. Um, uh, to me, they're more of a reamer than they are uh, uh, anything else because you can see it's a four-sided taper, and you just put it in the hole and twist it around, and it cleans it out, and they are super nice. Anyway, um, while I was doing that, it occurred to me that I should check the fit of uh, of one of the spoke nipples. And I did that, and it, and it was perfect, but actually uh, too perfect. Um, it was a really nice slide fit, but it didn't offer any slop. And I already know how this is going to go. Um, some of these holes are not going to be at quite the right angle. And if I end up having to force it, the spoke is going to get bent a little bit. And that's not going to look right either. And so I decided to go around and chase these holes uh, with a, another slightly larger bit. So I've poked all of them out to... Uh, a, uh, a 1.1 millimeter, which um, will offer just a little bit of slop so that um, hopefully I won't have to really manhandle any of the uh, uh, spokes uh, to get it all done. And I'll show you here as quickly as I can get one out. I should have taken one out before, um, but you can see what I mean. These, these nipples are just wonderfully turned little bits of aluminum, and with the length that they are and the depth of the hole, they're just not going to be a lot of wiggle. 
Um, so they need to be a relatively loose fit, and you can see now what I have. And I think that'll be perfect, because that will allow for just a little bit of misalignment um, and having a slightly loose uh, hole there is not an unusual thing for spokes and rims and nipples and all that. So, And as you can see, the nipple bulges, <laughs> there you go, drink again, um, are now... Uh, Come on, camera, come focus up, for crying out loud. You can see they're almost gone now, and that's fine, because there are a few of them that are just horribly misaligned. So at any rate, that's that, that's done, and I'm not gonna go back and bead blast them again. They look good, they've got a nice grippy texture for some primer, um, which is, as I keep saying, gonna be this gravity 2K uh, surface primer. 2K meaning that it has a resin and a hardener component. Uh, so it, I mean, it's a urethane, and it's going to be really tough and really grippy, and it'll and it's a high build, so it'll fill up, uh, you know, some little imperfections. I had a few imperfections that were large enough that I went ahead and filled them with thin super glue and sanded them down, and I think that'll be good. Um, so I think these are going to look good uh, once I get them in primer. And I am going to go ahead and prime the rims and the hubs before um, I actually build the wheel. Uh, because I want to I wanna make sure that the finish is good and that I don't need to do a bunch more fettling, um, you know, before um, I actually uh, get the spokes in there. Because uh, once the spokes are in, it's, it's over. Uh, whatever's there is, is going to be there. Um, it also occurred to me this morning that I need to make sure that these two pieces of the rear hub fit together properly. And they do. Again, I'm really impressed with the fit of these parts. That's a nice tight fit. But as you can see, I also need to deal with that joint. Um, and I'm going to do that before primer. But you're supposed to put the rear axle inside here before you assemble those two halves, if I understand the instructions correctly. So I'm going to pop those back apart, and uh, that'll be my next task. And hopefully, maybe, by tomorrow, I can... Uh, I can shoot some primer on these. Um, one last thing that I wanted to point out is when you do this uh, bead blasted finish, that takes finger oils and every other kind of grime very well. So it's important to handle them as little as possible. That's going to be a problem given that I have to assemble these and all that. But uh, a good wipe down with lacquer thinner will be essential before I before I prime them and uh, not with a rag you don't want anything that'll leave lint because it will come off on that rough texture just like it was velcro so anyway enough rambling okay so there you go now uh, the next episode hopefully will kick off with properly primed parts <laughs> another one of those uh, P alliteration things and um, I'll get these things all laced up and painted. So we'll see. Hopefully it'll, it'll go smooth. Um, it's been a lot of prep work up to this point, but hopefully it'll all pay off. Anyway, as always, uh, if you're keeping up with this adventure, I definitely appreciate it and much love.